The N64, despite being a massive success in the West that many of us here remember growing up with and having a great time with, has one of the smallest game libraries in any home console released from the four big companies. A lot of this, of course, had to do with the system's limitations, its graphic capabilities, and proprietary cart-based storage medium. These issues caused many developers to stray away from the system and flat out made some games, like the JRPGs that were beginning to take the world by storm, impossible to make on such a console. Console. This doesn't mean a lot of games weren't made for the system, but the West simply didn't get very many of them. One of the most notorious games we didn't get would be 2000's Sin and Punishment, the on-rails shooter developed by Treasure and Nintendo's R&D 1. Now, those who know Treasure know what they're all about. Treasure was a small studio that made really high quality niche gameplay experiences on what appeared to be micro budgets. Unfortunately, because of the budgets, the games weren't easy to sell, and because of the genres they worked in, often outdated genres whose heyday has long passed, there just wasn't much confidence in their games getting good sales at all. So games like Sin and Punishment on the N64 was an easy game to leave behind. They would have more luck with later games, such as my personal favorite, Ikaruga, but sales on their games in general was never enough. Treasure Today hasn't released a game in over six years, and they only exist as a skeleton crew of employees whose only job now seems to be finding new ways and places to relaunch their old games. In 2007, by virtue of the Virtual Console on the Wii, and in anticipation for the game's upcoming sequel, the West would finally see an official North American release of Sin and Punishment, but even then, this release was limited to digital only. Today, all online functions for the Wii that were directly hosted by Nintendo have been discontinued. So if you're looking to check this game out on there, you can think again. However, if you happen to be one of the small handful of Wii U owners thinking something along the lines of, Listen here, motherfucker. As soon as Xenoblade Chronicles X gets ported to the Switch, I am selling your ass on the corner for beer money. Well, don't. The Virtual Console is still active on the Wii U, and seems to be the last hope for playing the first Sin and Punishment game in a legal and legitimate way. Well, unless of course you import the Japanese Nintendo 64 cart, or God forbid, China's version for the IQ player, which I doubt many people watching own or even know what that is. Knowing Nintendo, the Wii U's online services all but have a death date written in stone. Unless they've completely forgotten that the Wii U exists like they want us to, we can expect that this service is going to go away soon, and with it, many games like this one, with no other way to play them, will go with it. So unless, of course, the Virtual Console migrates to Switch soon with all previous games intact, let's take a look at what we in North America are about to miss out on, as well as its follow-up game, Sin and Punishment Star Successor, on the Wii. Let's start with Sin and Punishment 1 and talk about the gameplay. Sin and Punishment's gameplay, like most treasure games, is incredibly simple, but very effective. Well, it is once you get the controls mapped to your tastes. When I played, I used the Wii Classic controller, but let's not kid ourselves. The N64 controller was weird and kind of garbage, and remapping its buttons onto any other type of controller can be a bit tricky. But it can be done. The way I eventually had the game mapped, I was using the D-pad to move my character around the screen, and the right stick to move my aiming reticle. Double tapping on the D-pad left and right works as a dash or evade, and I had the left trigger mapped to a jump and double jump. Holding the right trigger worked as my fire button, however a quick tap is a melee attack. This is pretty much all the game gives you to work with, but really, it's all you need. Fundamentally, the gameplay is simple. Move around to avoid projectiles and kill anything that moves. Certain parts of the environment can be destroyed to take out groups of people at once, and certain projectiles like missiles can be hit with a quick melee attack to be sent off wherever your reticle is aiming. You can also use the melee attack for enemies that are at close range, but I often felt the melee wasn't all that consistent. Like maybe my quick taps were too quick, and the game would register the input as me continuing to fire rather than trying to use my melee. The evade and dash mechanics are super Super important to combat, at times seeming to negate any form of damage and grant invincibility frames far more than a player needs or deserves, which of course made my gameplay look more like somebody playing Dark Souls who rolls as if stamina was infinite. There isn't any real sort of power-ups you can collect throughout the game to make your weapons stronger, but there are bonus score multipliers you can get as well as time extensions for the stage. I'm not really much of a score chaser, I'm mostly just here for the intense action, but I did try to get the 
these bonuses when I seen them because they're just another target for me to fire at. I did have the clock run up on me a few times, but thankfully, unlike older platformers, it's not a game over state. It just prevents you from getting bonus score when the stage is complete. This non-game over state timer isn't the only thing that makes the game easy though. And mark my words, it is very easy. Enemies in general don't have that great of aim and they don't take much to kill. So death is rare. Too rare, I would say, considering the nearly absurd amount of continues they give you for what's already an easy game. All in though, this does make the game a pretty comfortable one-sitter, which given its price, I'm really not too miffed about. It's only about three and a half hours long on a first playthrough. Easy though it may be, it really is worth it to run through, as the level design, especially for a console game of this nature and for its time, is just fantastic. An absolute feast for the eyes. Every stage is constantly evolving, throwing new things at you, whether they be enemies, stage hazards, or simply cinematic background noise. It's hard to play and not be in awe of this beautiful kaleidoscopic visual cacophony. The bosses especially, of which there are many, are a real highlight of the experience, each presenting a new challenge to overcome and challenging you in new ways within the game's limited mechanics. However, you may have noticed the game is somewhat... how do I say it? Hideous? Well, it's not exactly ugly for poor reason. In order to keep the maelstrom of chaos running smooth, Sin and Punishment was designed to use as few polygons as possible. It is, at the end of the day, a necessary evil. However, this evil comes at a cost during cutscenes, where the ugly models are combined with some really poor animation and extremely compressed voices. I guess Brad just didn't want to be hated by mankind. The entire time I was watching these cutscenes, I was flabbergasted. Even for the age of the game, this animation is poor. It's so shocking and bad in so many ways that at times, it disoriented me. And it honestly made it hard to keep up with what was going on in the story. And so I had to double check with Wikipedia to make sure that I understood it all. Now just keep in mind that this game was made in the year 2000, but it takes place in the semi-close future of 2007. And from this future, we even get views into the more distant future of 2017. Suffice to say, their view of 2017 is as off as you can expect considering what 2007 looks like. But it is a really fun and imaginative, dated look into this world. Basically, in the year 2007, Earth has a growing famine problem. To fix this issue, a new form of creature is created by some scientists in a lab, but they quickly revolt and start attacking the humans they were created to be food for, exacerbating the ongoing issue the famine already started of potential extinction. From here, a few different factions of people take up arms against the creatures, only not everybody exactly has the good of mankind in mind, and so they start clashing. Somewhere along the way, some Akira shit starts happening with one of our main characters, and things just get more messy and confusing from there. The story is really nothing special at all, just some pathetic weak glue meant to hold you to the adventure in some logical sort of way. If you're getting into this game at all, you'll want to do it for the gameplay. With a story such as this told as poorly as it is, the best thing that could have happened to it is for the cutscenes that tell us the story to become some ongoing joke that you get to play witness to and laugh at between stages. Hell, even the epic moments, like when the main character first gets their character and gameplay defining weapon, not even they could be spared. Saki! Oh, Saki! Good morning, Saki. Good morning, Iron. Come on, we've got work to do. It's like the amazing Balk, really, and I probably wouldn't want to have it any other way. So yeah, that's the first sin and punishment. It's far from perfect and very dated, but as far as the N64 library goes, it still holds up pretty well. It's short, it's easy, it's got some issues, thankfully relegated mostly to the passive parts of the game, but it's cheap, and it's a hell of a lot of fun. An easy game to recommend, especially if you plan on doing a second playthrough, or playing with a buddy on its multiplayer mode. Just don't jump in looking for a good story. Now Sin and Punishment 2, Star Successor? This game is really quite incredible, and also a little bit bad. But, it is only bad in the same sorts of ways the first one is. The story, again, is nothing spectacular, but every single other aspect of the game is a radical improvement over the first. Let's start this one off where I left off with the last one. Models and animation are still a bit wonky, but are thankfully way cleaner than the first. The voiceovers? <laughs> Foolish boy, you truly intend to challenge us? Hand her over or die. 
your choice are a significant improvement, but obviously still not great. The voiceovers are of course not helped by the fact that the dialogue is about as bad as Star Wars Episode 2. I don't like sound. The music is hype as hell, and it sounds great coming off the Wii rather than the N64's crappy little synth chips. and the stability is still really tight. The story of this one I would say is a slight improvement, though it's still a pile of basically directionless and convoluted crap. Let's get the biggest question out of the way first. Do you need to play Sin and Punishment 1 to understand this one? And the answer is no, definitely not. I mean, the stories are a near incomprehensible mess anyway, but they really have very little to do with each other. One of our main characters did appear briefly in the first game, being used as nothing more than sequel bait, and the first game does shed light on why this certain character has special powers, but it's not a light that really needed shining, and it's not a backstory you really need to know. The game also has one twist that might mean more to you if you played the original, and if you played this game on the right mode, but even then, it's a twist that rings hollow. It is sequel bait for a sequel that never came. Sin and Punishment 2 has little to nothing to do with a famine issues and creatures gone rogue that the first one had. Rather, it has to do with the arbiters of life and death intervening on humans. In a fashion more typical to a JRPG, it has to do with battling God. Well, battling forces of people who act like gods, while trying to save an amnesiac-stricken girl who used to be one of their associates. A rather important associate, in fact, as these people hunt you relentlessly in attempts to get her back. But, my word, is this storytelling ever fucking clumsy? Well, it's great we made it this far. Let's hope nothing happens. Should be smooth sailing from here on out. But the story seems to take itself incredibly seriously, so I can't just write this off as intentional schlock. It seems to lack that presence of self-awareness. Unfortunately, because the execution of the cutscenes is far better, you can't get as much cheap laughs and thrills out of this story, and it kind of becomes even more sidelined than in the first. But don't take this as me saying the first game is better, because Sin and Punishment makes up for it in literally every other regard. The controls, first off, are a world of difference. Yes, this game uses motion controls to aim, but it works perfectly, and light gun games like this are one of the few areas I will give a pass to when it comes to motion control gaming. Besides, if you had to use an analog stick for this one, which you can as the game supports numerous controller configurations including the GameCube controller, you better have perfect control over small muscle movements or you are going to get your shit pushed in. Because the difficulty here is amped up tenfold, and the game is at least twice as long, clocking in at around 8 hours. Thankfully, to counteract the difficulty, there's a really forgiving checkpoint system as well as infinite continues, so the endless amounts of deaths that you can surely expect won't do much to create tedium, rather it inspires you to just keep trying and trying and getting better. Mechanically, Star Successor didn't add too much to the formula of the first. You now have a charge attack which is hugely useful, and the melee attacks feel more responsive, but otherwise, it's exactly the same. Well it's the same, but now with flying, which is pretty cool too. What I described in Sin and Punishment 1 as a beautiful kaleidoscopic visual cacophony is even more true here. Every stage is just an onslaught to your senses. Playing through this actually reminded me a lot of some of my favorite on-rail sequences from Nier Automata, though I would say this takes the ideas even further. Each stage honestly feels like a ride at a theme park, and there's never a moment to just relax. From incredible underwater rides battling crazy fish and submarines, to the dark recesses of space filled with fleets of ships ready to take aim and kill on sight, to, well, to this boss here, whose projectiles are so crazy I had to completely put aside the ideas of playing strategically and give 100% into nothing but my reflexes to get by. Even then, I hardly came out of it alive. There is just so much to see here. There are so many awesome gimmicks and stage ideas on display. One of my favorites, for example, is this one stage. You're jumping from train cart to train cart, while this dog-like creature chases you down from behind in this little display like a rearview mirror. While clearing the cart in front of you, you need to try and get yourself onto the same track as this dog creature and detach a cart so that he'll collide with it behind you. And that's just one part of one boss fight 
in a massive stage with several incredible bosses. Variety is the name of the game in Star Successor, and boy for how short it is, it certainly has a lot of it. I can actually say that this is probably one of the funnest games I've ever played, and I'm kind of kicking myself for not getting to it sooner. In fact, I've owned this game for a good 5 or 6 years now. I originally bought this game in a private sale for 10 bucks years ago, only to find out the next day that EB Games all across my province had just marked it down to five bucks. So yeah, I might have been swindled a bit, but it's easily worth the 10 I paid for it, and it's easily worth a lot more. Like Sin and Punishment 1, this game also has a multiplayer mode, but while my wife kind of sucks at games like this even more so than I do. You still working? Uh-huh. How much do you suck at on-rails shooters? Uh, very. Very sucks? Very sucks. Okay, thanks. And for the betterment of our relationship, much like we did with Mario 3D World, we've agreed not to play this together. It would just be a recipe for disaster, and not in a good way. Looking back at these games, I'm really disappointed to see that Treasure's no longer actively developing video games. I know they were kind of losing in the market, but they had something special. A little sad to see too that these games might get left behind entirely sometime soon, if a new release or port doesn't come around. Me personally, I'd like to see Sin and Punishment 1 remastered, and bundled together with its sequel and sold for the Switch. I'm picking the Switch here because the gyroscopic controls are just a lot better than what the PS4 has on offer, and the motion control stuff really is an integral part of the gameplay experience that I think needs to be intact. Although if it could come to PS4, especially like a VR copy with the motion controls, I'd be cool with that too. I just don't want these games to go away entirely. So, Sin and Punishment 1. Pretty good game for its time and still kind of holds up. It's worth playing, but it does have its drawbacks. The lacking difficulty, its gameplay length, and the budget being among the greatest issues. Sin and Punishment 2, despite being a decade old already, holds up incredibly well. In a way, it actually feels kind of timeless. It was amazing for its time, and it's still amazing now. At least, it's amazing if you're willing to put the story aside. I am happy to have taken the opportunity to look back at these two games. And if you got it in your backlog, fire up your Wii or Wii U and give it a whirl. The game is a total blast. And that's all I'm going to say on these two treasures by treasure. But before the video closes out, I am going to play a few more little hilarious cutscenes from Sin and Punishment 1, some of which, yes, will contain some pretty big spoilers. So if you care about uh, keeping this kind of shitty story intact and spoiler free, you might want to close out now. Otherwise, if you're just here for the laugh, stick around. If you guys like this video, you know the deal. Like, comment, subscribe, and share the video if you can. Links to all my socials are in the description below, and as always, folks, thanks for watching. The transport, Iron, take the control. Hurry, Stocky! Whoa! Hold on! Uh -oh. <laughs> Don't you realize how dangerous teleporting is? We can't go near him yet. Saki is nothing like you. I never thought you- Muffins everywhere. Papa! Soon I'll end it with them. But I can't win with your current powers. This has all been mere training. Simulation of a global war. You're crazy. You ruin Tokyo, we destroy the world too? Don't worry. You'll all live in a different world. But... Achi would... Let's go to America, Saki. Have a doctor take care of it. If a doctor can take care of it. <laughs> if they dissect me, it's over. They're close by. I'm not refusing her. Obviously, our hearts are growing closer. But in our hearts, there is still fear. There are still doubts. There are still places and feelings that can't be opened yet. We need more time to fully accept one another. We fought alongside you, believing you would save humanity. But you're using us as weapons with a different goal in mind. Uh-huh. 